folks, welcome. <clears throat> um, I'm Tim Mescott, I'm Dean of the Coles College. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming today to what we think will be uh, an exceptional insight into entrepreneurship, um, leadership, and, uh, and business success. Let me say uh, uh, before this program starts that tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock in the Student Senate University Rooms, General Charles Duke, who captained Apollo 16 and walked on the moon, uh, will be speaking. So if you got some time tomorrow, that will be a, um, an exceptional opportunity tomorrow to hear, uh, to hear General Duke talk about uh, his odyssey uh, on, on the moon. Uh, this is a, a special afternoon for us because I, I didn't, uh, and I hope you don't mind knowing my telling the story, you may not even remember, but the Coles College have been always looking for uh, entrepreneurial, innovative, creative, important business leaders uh, to serve on our advisory board. So many years ago, I was reading an article in the uh, Atlanta Business Chronicle. They talked about a successful Atlanta entrepreneur, a fellow by the name of Miller Choate, who was founder and chairman of Choate Construction, and a fascinating article about him. And as a, as a capitalist and as someone who is really devoted to uh, as little government as possible, I found the article very interesting because it chronicled uh, a very interesting story that Mr. Chodin started this company in 1989 after working for a number of years, over a 15 year period, uh, with other uh, construction companies all over, uh, predominantly in the southeast, but all over the country. He had, like many successful entrepreneurs, had decided to take the plunge and start his own business. And he did just that. And like many entrepreneurs who've amassed some startup capital to grow that business in 1989, 90, 91, it took every penny of personal savings to sustain that business and to grow Choate to a level where he as founder, as president, could pay himself. So for years, he didn't pay it. And then he finally paid it. And what this article chronicled, and I'm paraphrasing, um, is that the IRS, Internal Revenue Service, felt that the founder of this company, the entrepreneur, our guest today, Miller Chode, had actually paid himself too much. <laughs> now, you wouldn't believe that could happen in this capitalistic system, which says if you do, you get, if you don't do, you don't get. If you build a successful enterprise, you get to share in the success of that. But our own U.S. Internal Revenue Service said, no, nah, you paid yourself too much. And so they sued it. Now, like many people have been involved with the IRS over time, and I hope it never happens to any of us. Most of us, when we get that letter, or a letter, uh, that's very daunting, very imposing, very threatening, we roll over, you know, open up our pockets, just take what you want, just don't do, don't do, just leave me alone. But in this case, uh, this successful entrepreneur who worked hard for every incremental success that showed an experience up to that point said, uh, I'm not going to let you do this to you. And he fought it. And he fought it. And the IRS, which, which itself employs hundreds if not thousands of attorneys, loves those kinds of, of litigation because their pockets are deeper than anyone's pockets. And they will wear you down and wear you out physically and mentally, but financially as well. So the battle raged, continued on and on until today's uh, special distinguished lecturer beat the Internal Revenue Service. And I think you deserve a round of applause. <laughs> me to Mr. Cho, as this article went on, is the next year, the Internal Revenue Service came after him again. It's 
start all over in the beginning. And with a with a, a judicial decision, I guess a tax court decision that said basically told the IRS to bug off, to leave them alone, go find somebody else to pick on. But it's a, it's a story of perseverance and over lunch we had the opportunity to learn a, a, a great deal about uh, Mr. Choate's background, grew up on a farm, the cattle ranching family of Depression era parents who, who really stressed the value of hard work and perseverance and savings. And that's, that's really why Choate is where it is today, a company that has annual volume somewhere north of $650 million. But as importantly, besides being Entrepreneur of the Year by Merrill Lynch and uh, Ernst & Young, uh, Mr. Cho is actively involved with a number of nonprofits, including Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, where he served on the board of directors, founder of the Choate Foundation, supporting a variety of worthwhile causes, active in the Georgia Economic Development Authority, the Georgia Hospital Association, and a, a renowned national real estate organization called the Urban Land Institute, where years ago, Miller, we hosted a very special uh, executive from ULI, a fellow by the name of Bill Hudnut, and I guess you probably know Bill, was a old friend of mine, former mayor of uh, Indianapolis, mm. who, who we crafted an entire city. Uh, Mr. Choate was born in Nashville. He's a graduate of Vanderbilt University and has built an enterprise today with offices throughout the Southeast. But most importantly for today's, for this afternoon's, lecture is building 900 new apartments on this campus and a new 2600 car parking lot on this campus as well. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to introduce a friend and someone who I truly admire as a business leader, an entrepreneur, and, and, and really someone who's devoted to the community. Today's Tetley Distinguished Lecturer, Miller Chuck. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, can you hear me okay? I know that's important. Um, I'm going to tell you a few things as an entree, intro into my uh, speech and uh, what I hope to accomplish today. But first of all, um, it's daunting to know that I'm being followed by the man that walked on the moon. Um, <laughs> I, I haven't walked on the moon. <laughs> I've eaten moon pies, uh, you know, I've tried the moon dance, but um, nevertheless, that's, that's pretty cool to have that um, type of person here. It is an honor to be here. Uh, look at the board outside, the names, and it's an honor to be a part of that company, but it's an honor to you, the, everybody, the faculty, the students, that the Coles Business College has that much draw to attract the founder of Home Depot or go through the whole list. That's very impressive and I think that's something that um, the entire uh, Coles College should be commended for and that's, that's very good. Um, what I'm gonna try to do today is, is, to, is to go through a three part um, discussion. One, a little bit of background, a little bit of history. Some of it may seem to be a bit boastful, but I, I'm trying to give you facts so that you can learn from it and take away from this. Uh, two, I'll describe what personal attributes that I think that you going into the workforce need to assess and need to be aware of. Three, part of my um, discourse will be what do companies expect? What, that, what do we value when we recruit train and hire people. I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, I don't want to give you some big high-blown speech and you get nothing out of it. But my intention today is to deliver this. If it's helpful, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, I'll, I'll use the word ROI all through this speech. 
I got a feeling y'all know what ROI means, so I'm not going to have to explain it to you. It's French for king. No, but no. Um, but I, I, I really believe that that's the ultimate goal today is to mix it up a little bit if you can take something away from this. Then some Q&A. And I'm ready, you know. Um, I've been shot at before, so uh, bring it on. So uh, that's, that's kind of what I hope to accomplish. And if you have any other ideas, let me know as I go through this. Uh, first of all, in the interest of time, um, I'd like to go through a few things. My, my personal background, Tim mentioned some things. Yes, I, I grew up in a family. We didn't have a lot of money, so we had to work through college. Um, had to uh, um, try to get a scholarship, try to, try to uh, make things meet. So it was um, interesting going to school and trying to study and make good grades and uh, prepare myself for the workforce. Because I had, at the time, I had no earthly idea in a way what I wanted to do. So um, that's going to be part of the things I want to address as I get through this discussion. Um, so that background, and then went to work uh, initially with a bank uh, during the recession of 74, which I'm sure you don't remember, uh, but, uh, and then got into the construction arena. Um, I am, I got through college, uh, I got my engineering courses basically behind me, all the physics, statics, and everything, and guess what? I switched majors. I didn't want to be a true engineer. I have a dual in economics and business, and that's my degrees. Uh, I am thankful that I did that because I use my particularly both degrees and both knowledge every day in my business. Um, we don't engineer projects. We build them, organize them, buy them, and manage them. The economic training, the fundamentals, Understanding the, the dynamics of supply, demand. I won't bore you with inelastic supply. Uh, I'm sure you've had enough of that. But um, it, it is something that I use every day. My daughter is in high school, is taking economics. And so at night, I kind of help her the best I can. Um, one thing I will comment as a, uh, as a bit of a commentary. In my days, um, you know, the economic theory, uh, Keynes, the, the Samuelson, et cetera, studied hard, got it down pat. And about two years after I graduated, it was all obsolete because of the new economics and the new theories. Something called stagflation, which we never heard of. It was impossible in my world uh, where you could have that type of, you know, um, falling production of goods and services, yet increase in prices set in. And so that kind of rocked my world a little bit at the time. So, you, but your basic underpinnings of economics and business, I, I congratulate you. I think you picked the right thing to study. And I, and I think it's going to do you very well in that regard. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of history and see if this adds to things. Okay, we got that down, Pat. Um, that, by the way, for those with marketing bent, was one of the first things I did. I felt it very important to have a unique brand, the first logo, and I've got the original artwork where I was pinning it up and playing with testers, model, uh, model car paint. So I found a gold and I fiddled with it. Fiddled is a southern term. Uh, so I got, it, I got it the way I thought it would be, but I, I'm big on, on consistent branding, consistent uh, everything. It doesn't have phone numbers by it, but it was very important at the time, and it's done us very well. Quickly, uh, these are our current offices. Uh, we are also very close to starting one in Nashville, uh, Tennessee. So Atlanta, Charlotte, Savannah, Charleston, Raleigh. Uh, these are some of our clients. Uh, you can pick out names here, some of which I'm very proud of. Proud of. One across the street named Heidelberg. Uh, who has been very involved with a lot of different things, but they're, f they're, they're excellent people. Pace Setter is across the street, and we have a lot of Cobb County uh, type companies represented on the list. So it uh, gives you a little bit of background there, okay? Uh, as far as beating your chest, rankings and all, as far as volume, it's, it's okay. Uh, we are number nine, the top southeast. We're number 
of the national top, ENR 400, we're now ranked 79 in the country. We're number 80 in design build, 57 seem at risk. And then locally, um, uh, in South Carolina, we are, are the number one uh, contractor in Charleston, number two in, in uh, Charlotte. So you can read those yourselves. So anyway, that's kind of some of the rankings. Chevy Interior Construction is an autonomous group that is totally separate, and we are uh, the largest in greater Atlanta. So, uh, and then we're number four as the top general contractor in terms of size in Georgia. Size is not what is my goal, honestly. I actually had to read those myself a little bit. Um, it all comes back to another term you'll hear me use today, the big R, reputation. Reputation. Everything goes to reputation, both as a company and to you individually. You, you better start thinking about your individual and personal reputation as you go through, because uh, that's what's going to come to bear uh, in terms of the assessment of you and the business community. Um, let me finish this. I, you know, we, uh, she threw in some stuff uh, just to give you an idea. Private sector work for everything from retail, uh, the Upper right is Jeff Gordon's uh, race headquarters facility and race shops. We've done just about all the NASCAR, very high tech facilities for Hendrick Motorsports, Haas Racing, Roger Penske, um, Roush. So it's been kind of a, a niche that we started in our Charlotte office and they're extremely complex projects, very high tech uh, in terms of these types of facilities. So we do a lot of repeat work. Uh, approaching 70% of our client list is for repeat clients. So anyway, to give you an idea, and then she threw in Tilt Wall. Um, if you can read that, you're better than I am. Um, and so let's just suffice to say it's, it's a wide variety. Um, and I'll come back to that a little bit when history. Um, when I started this company, it was in the, the room, a basement room of the house I live in today and I had a desk, and I sat there and said, okay, here we go. <laughs> so uh, it was a little bit daunting at the time, and the hallmark of it, though, was when you've got everything on the line and you're risking everything, you tend to have that, what I call the survival mode, the lean and mean, get work, and I didn't care what it was within reason. Um, uh, but all types of work, it made you go after all venues, and it was very important to get work to survive. The only tr work that I truly turned down, believe it or not, was to build the gold club. <laughs> I just didn't want any part of that part of it, but <laughs> uh, not where I wanted to sign, to be quite honest with you. So, oh, uh, the golden club. So um, anyway, the, but, but you go after everything, medical, interiors, industrial, manufacturing. And so today, it's paid off for us for, in terms of diversity. As you have declining sectors of the market, other sectors are stable or going up. Healthcare, hospitals are, are important to us. For example, we're finishing a 10-story tower at Shepherd Spinal Center. Um, uh, another uh, friend that uh, Tim and I both have is Newton uh, Medical Center. So, but you go after everything and it gives you wonderful balancing and diversity. So, uh, we choked water, water treatment group uh, cranked up two years ago, and that's our newest division, if you will. So it's, it's uh, as you consider things, consider diversity, consider firms that have diversity, that with the first hiccup or pullback, that they're not going through massive layoffs. I think that's terribly important. Uh, we are very fortunate. We've been blessed with great clients. We've never had to lay off a person in our history. Now, we've enhanced people's careers uh, by having them move on uh, when they didn't perform. I can't say that, but we wanted them to get in the environment where they would be most productive. So um, uh, the other thing that I will say um, that will give some background to my talk today is my personal observations. As I said, I grew up waste not, want not. We didn't waste anything. Um, at all. Someone told my mother that the most expensive appliance in the house is a hot water heater. She started putting cold water into the gravy train for the dogs and heated it on the stove. So, uh, but um, we wasted nothing. Waste is a 
bad word to me. Waste is the ultimate economic sin. Return on investment is the flip side of waste. Don't waste anything. Laziness is the ultimate waste. You know, apathy, laziness, pick, pick, a, pick one. But you want to basically make yourself into, if you will, a commodity, an efficient commodity uh, that you can get fired up about. But don't waste anything. Um, I'm going to ramble a little bit and get to the gist of this. A lot of retail uh, experience, uh, a lot of industrial manufacturing, both assembly plants to plastics to uh, everything. And I'll, I think there's another shot in here of a pretty cool Cobb County job I'll show you in a minute. Um, a little bit more on the history. In um, 1980, when I, I was with another firm, I was the uh, managing partner, and I had to build an, this project uh, in South Florida. It was, the only problem is they committed from clearing to this picture was 121 days uh, to build this facility. And it was for a launch of a new product. President of the new division brought people from all over the country to this building to launch the new product. We didn't know what it was at first. It turned out to be something called the personal computer. IBM had to get on the market. Apple and Tandy were about to launch. And this time was of the essence to get this building up and running for final development, uh, uh, executive briefing, et cetera, and launch facility for the, the PC. And so this is the building in Delray Beach that it came from. Uh, it got me in tune with speed, time is money, uh, efficiency again, and how do you make the best of things, and technology. As I discussed at lunch, you can, technology is a wonderful tool and we'll demonstrate some uses of it. Uh, it can help you immensely. You can become a slave to it if you let it do so. So there are ways that we, in a, as our firm, we teach protocol on how to handle email, for example, and what to send an email, what not to send an email. Uh, uh, some of the other uh, highly technical tools, whether it's digital analysis, scanning, uh, et cetera, it's just transformed our industry, particularly in the pre-construction side on project analyses. Today, for example, uh, you can say, what did you pay for uh, the foundation coding material on a project we did years ago? Six keystrokes later, there's the invoice with the notes and everything. Everything is reduced to digital uh, in storage, so it's, it's terribly good and efficient. So that's that building. I'll get on past this. We did the division headquarters uh, about three years later in Boca Raton, and that's a little bit of a background for those buildings um, and more of those. And then projects like this, this is on Mount Perrin Road here, the Noro facility. Um, and there's our, one of our common clients. We're just now adding a fourth floor to that facility and finishing it up today. So the great client is Newton Medical Center. Um, similar projects, uh, we, uh, a couple of years ago, finished the new East Campus Village at UGA. Uh, student housing has become a large component of our work. You've got an example of it going up right over here uh, with uh, 913 beds. Uh, it's going to be a cool facility um, in the way, not just the building, but the, the amenities, the site, and the layout. Um, this was uh, 1,220 beds, and we did this and also the East Campus Village and Dining uh, Commons facility. So, um, in fact, that was that, that's the dining facility that we did there. So, winding up a little bit, uh, as far as student housing, pick a college, here a college, there a college, um, pick them. I mean, Georgia Southwestern, Gordon, uh, we've been very fortunate in having built at all these places. In fact, we're doing about four or five as we speak today at uh, Georgia Southwestern and um, West Georgia. So it's been a good experience. And then uh, other college facilities, we do a lot of science. Uh, we do a lot of clean rooms, ph big pharmaceutical. This is the uh, nine-story uh, lab science facility at UNC Chapel Hill. And here you are. This is a rendering of coming into the entrance to your new facility. And again, a lot of attention has been paid to the site and the amenities and how the feel 
will be. Uh, this is a wonderful campus. I've seen a lot, and the way your campus lays out is, is phenomenal. So I think it's something you're going to be proud of. It's a little bit older aerial today. If you go by there, we're already up to the fourth floor uh, on the wings with a hybrid type construction. And there's that. Other types of projects are mixed use. This is one in Nashville. It'll be a 30, 32 story tower and a mixed use type facility. And that's what that will look like. This is our company plane. Um, we, don't, we don't beat our competition, we strafe them. Um, this is cool facility, uh, and I get off all this, but uh, Lockheed had to build a robotics coatings facility. The stealth coating on the plane, which makes it invisible, unfortunately, is highly toxic. It would kill you if you ingested any of it. So we had to do a first of a kind where this robot goes around the aircraft from the computer control center and applies the stealth coating. Well, a little bit of overspray gets swept by this laminar flow. Those are HEPA filters in the doors across and through the large spray curtain, which hydrates the air. Then we distill it and condense it on large chiller coils to trap the particulate. So um, that's about all I can tell you. If I told you any more details, <laughs> you know. So, and there's just a few more shots. This is a cool facility. This is, if anybody's into NASCAR, this is Jeff Gordon's uh, headquarters and. Uh, it's pretty, pretty upscale. So, and then all his build shops. These are like I think this one is Ralph, uh, Penske. Uh, so if you get into that, then mixed use of all types, such as in Charlotte, and hospitality. Uh, we just finished the new phase two, the practice facility for the basketball, the gymnastics at Stegman. And if you watch CNN news, it's, uh, we built the facilities and the stuff there. This is just some marketing stuff. <laughs> um, so you can get copies of this later if you really want it. Um, so that's, that's a quick background. And again, uh, to give you an idea of things, um, it's been, a, it's been a, quite a road uh, since that basement day in June 13th of 1989. Uh, it's uh, not been without its costs. It's, it's uh, had a few sleepless nights through the whole course of this thing. But overall, it's been a, a true adventure in entrepreneurship. Um, and again, not to boast, but a cool thing that I got to be part of was the Entrepreneur of the Year um, program because I got to be a judge. Uh, for a couple of years in assessing companies and what they did right and wrong. And it really is, it w was a good learning experience for me. Um, so that's, that's basically it as far as who we are as a company, our history, our evolution, and where we're going. Um, we anticipate in, oh, by 09, we'll, we'll eclipse the $1 billion mark for revenues. And, um, and we will have expanded uh, two more offices by that time. So that's the big um, story about Choate. Um, the next two parts I'm gonna do is to give you uh, the um, bit of comments. Uh, Tim said, address what, what do you look for in human resources? What do we expect? What do we wanna see? And I'm going to address those for just a few minutes as well. Um, first of all, the first part of this is self-assessment. I think you need to, to try to do this and say, uh, well, first of all, let me say, I have a, a daughter, two daughters, who had the burning question, gee, Dad, I don't know what I want to do. And they said, where do I go? Who do I apply with? What do I... Katie's in high school, what do I study? You know, I don't know what I want to do. Uh, I have one that's out of college, and it's a tough question. Um, times have changed since I came out myself. Today's, due to technology, uh, positions that are there today uh, are going to change, evolve, and morph. There's going to be positions today uh, in three years, we don't even know what they are yet, but they're going to be there. Technology is blowing us away in terms, we do a lot of pharmaceutical and uh, the evolution of the biomedical and everything is, is going to create 
support positions and technical positions and marketing positions and communications positions that don't exist today. So you're going to be in an environment where there's kind of a moving target, so to speak. There's going to be a lot of things to look at. Don't let that throw you. That's a positive. I think there's going to be an unbelievable opportunity, personally, and in terms of what do you want to do. I've, I'm not going to ask somebody to show their hands because it could be embarrassing, but I would, I would uh, bet you that not that many people really know, coming out of college, what they really want to do and where they want to wind up. Um, I strongly encourage self-assessment, objective as it can be. There are, of course, books written on it. There are, there are testing facilities that will, that will uh, test you and say, well, you have a bent towards this, and you have a bent towards that, and you like color, and you like this, and you like that, and the other. Um, but self-assessment is going to be key. Get some of those books. I know this, another courageous thing is if you have people who really know you, have them over, sit in the middle, and it's called a 360 degree review. Let them go around and let them tell you who you are. Let them tell you, I've tried this painfully, uh, even in my company, and I'll, you know, I tell the guys, I say, we're gonna use voice scramblers. But, um, <laughs> but I, really, I really do say, I say, okay guys, throw rocks. Invite the person to do both of those. What are your attributes? Where do they see that you're, what you like, what you dislike, where are your weaknesses? And consider doing a 360 degree session with friends that you trust. Um, failure is okay. I failed two or three times. Uh, it's okay. Um, great quote I heard at lunch, you're going you're, you're gonna to fall, fall forward. You know, and if you do, don't let it bother you. My advice is take a chance. You're young, you'll recover. You know, I was beset by this, this thing hammered in my head, thou shalt not fail. Thou shalt achieve and work hard and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I kind of resent that. I think it's okay to go out there, take a winger at something, try it, uh, do your best, work hard, give it plenty of time, uh, but if it doesn't work out, you're young, move on. And um, don't be afraid of a little setback here or there. If you're not doing it, I don't think you're stretching it as far as you should. Define to yourself what, what does success really mean to you? You know, again, in my generation, it was pretty simple. Achieve uh, assets, achieve assets. Um, it's not quite the same today. The mixture of, of Job, work, money, personal relationships, faith, um, philanthropy, community service. There's a whole matrix, if you will, that you could almost construct and come up with your own definition to help you try to home in closely. Read, read stuff, which you may already have read, Stephen Covey's you know, uh, books, uh, Seven Habits of Successful People. It's a great book. I, I recommend it to anyone uh, right now to read and take it to heart. Um, that's kind of the, the, the first of the self-assessment part. The next part um, is what, does, what would an, a prospective employer be looking for? What are the attributes that we look for? Um, I'm going to address my first <laughs> caveat to this is they're all different. I mean, not one size do not fit all. So um, different employers have different expectations, et cetera. I'm going to hit on some that I think there are common threads that run through all companies on what they're looking for. Um, and I'm going to go through a, a series of things here. First, here's, here's that, here's that well-worn term again, um, ROI. You will be an investment the employer is going to be looking for a return on investment. And it's, that's the first and overriding thing you need to remember at all times. Uh, you can be a great, fine person, a lot of fun, you know. Uh, you can be uh, artistic or whatever, but if once you get into that slot, you've got to try to satisfy that expectation of production. And what is, he look, what is the employer looking for? Um, the first thing I look for, personally, is work ethic. That's paramount, you know. 
um, I expect that to be overriding. Notice I'm putting that first, which is kind of contrary to a lot of books that you read. But the intensity, the work ethic, the willingness to jump in there and tear it up uh, is number one. Number two, I guess, is intensity. For years, when we cranked up our system every morning and you logged in, you saw this little, see, this little slot that said, Welcome to Cho Construction Company. Yeah, big whoop. Beneath it, three words, get pumped up every morning. Get pumped up. Get fired up. Have energy. Uh, don't be apathetic. I mean that sincerely. I, I, that's what I live for is that spark, that uh, fire in the belly, that let's get pumped up. Everybody that comes to work for us for years, I used to interview them myself, and I tell them, I said, hey, is this what you want to do? Is this get this in your mind, and if it is, get fired up. Go at it 110%, be a sponge, learn everything, and make this your profession. You go around one time, you know, one time alone. You can try different things, but still, at the end of the day, you want to home in on what is your best fit and where you're going to be the most self-satisfied. So I mean that's that's not just wow wow speech I'm giving you here. Get pumped up, run through walls, do whatever you got to do. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean your personality has to change. We have at our company we have we got a whole mixed bag of nuts. We got quiet people. We got run through wall people. We have it all. Uh, but but there's still that pumped up intensity that permeates the organization. So that's my next bit of advice. The next thing is so terribly important. Uh, notice I haven't got to experience or qualifications yet. The next most important thing, people skills. Now, if you're uh, some, it doesn't apply to everybody as equally. If you're a scientist that works alone or you're on, in the Antarctic studying the yak or whatever, it's not quite as important. But I'll bet you 95% of the people in this room will be dealing with people. And people, is, is, it's the art of sales, if you will. Um, it's how to get people to do what you want them to do. And they're all different. Being able to judge people, but people skills. Being able to get along with people uh, is terribly important. Um, we, I always said, it's an old term I heard years ago with terms of get convincing someone to get more men on the job or to show up and uh, participate or whatever, uh, to do whatever you need. It's how to step on their toes without getting their shoes dirty. It's how to influence them to do what you need for them to do and let them come to that determination on their own. So people skills is terribly important. Um, Intelligence is next. Innate intelligence, being sharp, being on the ball, not being asleep, um, you know, being intense enough to say, hey, I'm, I like this, I'm going to be there, and um, take it to heart. And then also the, combined with the work ethic, taking on the things that may not seem quite as juicy or glorious right at the get-go. So uh, I strongly encourage that as well. Be serious about your career. This is not a game. When you go to work with someone, they're not there, you know, honestly, to, uh, for your benefit. You're there for the company's benefit. Get very serious about what you want to do and go after it that way. Um, the other thing I'll say, your diploma, and I mean this, doesn't get you there. Your diploma only gets you admitted to the arena. What I'm trying to say is, we've had some people come in and they think, oh, hey man, hey, I got, I got a college diploma, I'm there. Uh-uh, it's not auto ride. Uh, it's, it gets you the opportunity to jump in and learn because you will apply, you'll use what you've learned here, but you're still gonna learn a whole nother round of information. You're gonna have to be trained and you're going to have to do it. Embrace the company and its procedures. Um, do it the way it's described. Don't challenge it right off the bat. Do it, do it for a while, 
then make suggestions. Uh, we had a young guy came with us in our Waller office. I mean, smart as a whip. Good looking young man, dressed well, carried himself well. Just, I mean, perfect. You know, whoa. Um, he was so smart. He just, he knew everything. He, and we were so archaic that our procedures just didn't make sense. Yeah. Well, a funny thing happened. I would start getting job reports. I noticed his projects weren't doing as well. And they started to go down. And at the end of the day, we talked to this guy and talked to him. And finally, I told the division manager, I said, fire him. You know, because he didn't come in, embrace the procedures, be a team player, and then make suggestions. Remember, I like suggestions. We, we want to improve ourselves. But he was so eat up with himself that it just didn't work. And um, he, he, he really didn't understand it. So come in initially, at least, and embrace the company and its systems. Um, above all, make yourself irreplaceable. You've probably heard that before. But you want to make yourself such an integral, valued part of that company that, that in their minds it would hurt them if you left. That will make you a valued player. You will command higher salary. Uh, you will command quicker promotions. And uh, invariably, you, you would be an integral player. You know, as I look out and I know if anyone, and I'm not just blowing smoke, of the staff here and the faculty were to leave, or the administration, it would hurt KSU because you got players. And so make yourself irreplaceable, if you will, and uh, of value. Um, use judgment. We look for judgment, people that can decide things. We don't look for mavericks. Uh, we don't look for people come in and their ego says, I can do it all and I'll make those decisions. Uh, no, use judgment on when to ask. If in doubt, always ask. Don't just take a winger and, and do it. In our business, it could cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars if a wrong judgment is made. So know when to ask, you know, what you need to ask for. Uh, don't let your ego stand in the way. Become adept at problem solving. Whatever position you go into, in addition to people skills, you're going to be there in one form or fashion to solve some kind of problem uh, or solution to some need. Everything is, is tends to be need-based or problem-based. So um, I look for people who I think will be able to solve problems. Um, the, when I think of the people I value the most in our own company, it's those guys and, and, and ladies that I have the innate confidence in that they're going to hit a roadblock, they're going to have a problem, but you know what, I'm, I'm comfortable that they will wrestle with it and resolve it as best as it can be handled. That's the ultimate confidence when I can delegate and let people take care of things like that. Um, I'm okay time-wise. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, again, your economics. And your economics training is going to do you very well. Don't, don't think that's it, you know. Um, one of my daughters got out of college, said, boy, glad that's over. Got my education done. I said, sweetie, it's just starting. Uh, I personally take quite a bit of online continuing ed courses. Um, I have to keep it up. You're going to be continually in education. You know, the old, the old paradigm of, what's it, birth, child, school, work, die is no longer. It's, I think I got to help me with this. Birth, child, school. Work, school, work, <laughs> leisure, die. So um, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be challenged with more and more education. As times change quickly, you're going to have to have education. I'm starting a, a course, another course myself. We're uh, very big in what's called LEED, L-E-E-D, uh, Leadership in Engineering and Environmental Design. And I'm going to have my own LEED certification. So I'm always having to, I, us, myself and our people are continuing to c wrestle with more and more education and retraining, if you will. Um, you know, I've, what was the firm, um, it was either Microsoft or one of those out in California, they, 
all got together when they formed the company and said, no turkeys. They said, we're going to have a certain level that we're going to recruit at, and we're going to stick to our guns there. So uh, no hot dogs. The other thing is no morale busters. Don't ever get into a company and start, well, it's us versus them. It's, you know, the grapevine, and, or you do something that could ever, ever, ever um, attack the morale of a company. We, Chair Construction Company, as much as I would like to think, it's not me. It's about uh, 400 other people that do an excellent job. And they, they have to stay pumped up. They have to have an esprit de corps. You know, we, we have to keep that up, and that's terribly important. And one of the people I just love the most is one of the people, th these people, they get fired up, and they're positive, and they help do things that keep that spirit up. So uh, the, the, those people, to me, are invaluable. Um, mistakes are okay. Honest mistakes, no problem. I, personally, I can handle those because everybody's going to make mistakes. If you're not, you're not pushing it. You're not doing enough. Uh, mistakes are fine. However, mistakes due to negligence or laziness uh, are not fine. And those will get you in hot water pretty quick. Um, and then the other thing, bluntly, um, I've seen some companies, particularly big firms, where they have, um, I guess what the nice term is they have um, people that are always kind of sucking up to the next manager up and trying to be Mr. Great Guy and all that stuff. That's pretty obvious to us. We're not, we didn't fall off the turnip truck, so uh, I would caution against that. Just be honest and be yourself and work hard and do it that way. The other thing is, um, my advice is go into anything with a sense of humility. You go in and you think, well, I'm the big cheese or, you know, well, I'm big, the big kahuna on this and, you know, you're, you're just, et cetera. I have more respect for the man out there on that job tying re-steel, as much respect for him as I do our IT man or anyone else. And I mean that. I came from there. I did that. I was a laborer. Respect. You have to treat each other with respect and you don't come in with the big head. I never forget one uh, Monday morning we had our monthly staff meeting. I walked into the conference room and everybody's sitting there ready to go. There's this young guy with his chair to the side of the table, not facing the table, turned this way. And he was kind of like this. And I mean, who is this guy? I never knew who the guy was. I said, who is it? He was a brand new hire that, that came on. And he was there like, hey, I'm Joe Cool. You know, let's rock and roll. So he didn't last long. <laughs> and it didn't have anything to do with me at all. I could just, but I got vibes very quickly. I said, this guy has, he's not going to really pitch in and be a team player. So um, try to, try to, don't get too hung up on yourself and be humble. Uh, you know, where you came from, you could well return very quickly. In my business, it's very risky. Here today, gone tomorrow. So I've never forgotten that. Um, so just be, um, be aware of those things, the continuing education. Um, and that's my advice to you, at least on what, how to appeal to people. When I advise my own daughter, I said, when you go in there, you let these people know that you are committed, that you're going to put your heart into it, you're going to take it seriously. You're going to want to learn everything. You're going to want to teach you as much as you can, uh, as much as you can take in as quickly. And you come across with that with a prospective employer, uh, they're going to get fired up. So you need to get them enthused about you. When I sell our company in a presentation, the biggest challenge is, you know, contractors in essence are almost, a, they're everywhere. There's a vast amount, of, particularly in Atlanta, Georgia, that eat up with good contractors. How do, do we distinguish ourselves against the pack? What sets us apart? I challenge our presentation teams. What makes that person want to hire us? What is distinguishing about us? And it's going to come back to people. It's not all those fancy pictures or logos and all that stuff. It's going to be who they think they're working with. And you've got to come across as sharp, enthused, pumped up, 
and where to rock on their job. So how do you set yourself apart? What is distinguishing? You know, I, don't, I hate it when a project manager goes in a presentation and says, well, okay, I'm, um, I'm gonna do the monthly application for payment and the daily reports and you know all this other stuff. I said, everybody's doing that. Think of what are you gonna say to uh, enthuse these people. I'm saying apply it to yourself personally. Think when you go in to speak with someone, holy cow, how am I going to, how, how am I gonna have this person remember me? In a positive sense now. Um, but how can I, what, what do I have to do that's gonna distinguish me or set me apart? Uh, so um, that's my advice. As, uh, as I say, that's all I have to say about that. So um, that's kind of the end of my talk. And again, I hope time is okay and everything. And um, um, I hope that made some sense to you um, and would help you. Now. Q&A on things of anything of any nature, you know, other than personal. So, um, but it's, can I, you know, zing me. Is there any questions you'd like to ask about me or the company or, or as a prospective employer or whatever? Yes, sir. What inspired you to go into business for yourself? Um, kind of in the back of my mind, he, uh, the question is what inspired me to go into business? Uh, I knew in the back of my mind uh, that I would someday, it was more of a series of events. The firm I was with at the time got involved in development, and I think the senior, the two other guys, the two other partners wanted to go more that route. I wanted to be a contractor, and so it, it kind of lent itself to that, and rather than go with another firm, I'd been running the company for about 10 years anyway, and I thought, well, I might as well go ahead and take a swing at it. And that's really kind of how I got going. Yes, sir. So what's the difference between development and contracting? Um, development as a generic term, a developer is a firm or an individual or a firm who comes in, assembles, or first I guess the project need identified. The user assembles the land. The financing is one of the big, biggest things. Etc. engages the architect, the engineers, the contractor, um, and sometimes owns the property or does it as a fee developer on behalf, in this case, of a university or a client. That's the develop overall development process. The construction or the contractor is purely the actual um, pre-construction planning, pricing, scheduling, and the actual construction itself of the facility within that domain. Sometimes the, the developers is needed, sometimes they're not. Uh, many of our university clients, they already have the land, the financing, et cetera, and they really don't need a developer per se. Yes, ma'am. Do y'all have in-house estimators or do you use outside? We do everything in-house, from digital analyses, estimating, the full gamut, um, the whole bit, you know, studying, um, scheduling, so we don't use any outside sources. Yes, sir. Hey, Miller, John Anderson. John, how are you? Facilities, yeah. He's my boss. Uh, yeah, y'all are doing a great job. In, in my job, I get to see hundreds of different organizations, contractors, architects, um, government organizations, board of regions, GSFIC, and, um, you're one of the rare ones. You'd make my top ten for sure as far as just the efficiency and the, um, the quality of people. But there's nobody on your team that I've worked with that doesn't do what they say they're going to do. And they, they're just a pleasure to work with. And, and I would zing you if I had something to zing you about. But I know those projects are going well because you've got the right people on the job. Um, um, they just know what they're doing. And my question is, what type of hiring process do y'all go through to um, name that, maintain that type of workforce, and um, and also what type of reward system do you have to keep the best people? Okay, that's a good question. Um, we we have been somewhat. Let me describe our company again a little bit smaller. We sound like a big company, right? We're really not. We're a group of small companies. We have separate individual, if you will, like Charlotte, Raleigh, Charles and Savannah. But even within them, we have separate profit centers. I want it that way. 
I want them to keep that entrepreneurial, lean and mean. I want them to be trained as business people. Um, and I'm gonna answer your second question first. Our people are, are all, everybody in our company, uh, as far as, well I shouldn't say everybody, um, well even some admins are under this program, uh, but estimators, project managers, superintendents, quality control, safety, is under an incentive program. And the, the deal is, like a division manager, uh, he manages a number of projects, okay, and the idea is to build them efficiently and as quickly as we can and high quality as we can so we get paid on time, which keeps cash flow going, okay, and then you have that basically that, um, that margin. From that, you take away all overhead, all costs of the division. So it's an incentive to him to want to manage overhead as much as revenue. Penny saved is a penny earned. Uh, that's an old economic principle, but, but truly that dollar saved is equal to a dollar earned in our book. So th there's that type of incentive. It has to be administered on a basis that it enhances performance without some of the ill effects of it. In other words, you don't want to you don't want to send someone to get so aggressive that they don't do a good job or they try to do something that's not good for the project. But we have a systems of overview that, that, that would catch that in the first place. Um, so I believe in that. You know, my income, me, comes, I, I'm, the, I'm the number one incentive person in the company. Because, you know, uh, particularly when you are a young company, you write checks out of your personal checking account and then you write checks out of your savings account. Um, and so there's a real incentive to manage overhead. Um, as far as our hiring process, we can't tout ourselves as this, the leaders in this regard. There are other companies, like in our Citadel group, which is a national, national group of best class contractors that we're in partnership with, they, they are, we're picking up ideas from them in terms of continuing education. And what we do now, uh, if we have a particular niche that we need to fill, the person comes in, they can now go online, take an evaluation test, not a great big long one, but one that takes about 30 minutes, that helps start to narrow it down, okay? As far as would it be a fit? Then, if that person is a candidate, we bring them in, and a minimum of three people have to talk to them, not just one, and you just get a better feel for things. And you take that data, and of course references, and you check it out. And they have to have, in our business, a certain amount of experience um, if they're coming in at a higher level. Uh, so we have to assess all that and put it together. Then we'll generally we'll have a second interview. Um, as I tell people, a candidate can be, uh, you know, we can be, uh, they can be perfect for us. They fit all our criteria and everything's just wonderful. But if we're not perfect for them, I advise them don't take the job or near perfect. It's, got, it's a two-way street. It has to mesh. You gotta fit the two together so that you come up with the best solution. But we, we, put a, we are putting more and more time into personnel recruiting. We have been very fortunate. We've had, again, almost no loss, no turnover uh, in a, since 12 years ago. So we've been very lucky in that regard. We, we truly look for a few good people. Yes, sir. Uh, with uh, you know, Atlanta being one of the fastest growing cities in the country, and with the current traffic problems that we have, and the way that urban sprawl kind of all fits into that, do you have any initiatives in, within your company in terms of um, trying to decide which projects to um, try to bid on to sort of combat that? Or I mean, do you have any kind of anything in your company that is going to try to help with it. You mean on traffic? Yeah, or you know, just anything within Atlanta that sort of can, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, will you really strip mall if you can make more money on that rather than, you know, like a multi-use <laughs> development yeah. that would benefit the community rather than the bottom? Well, it, it, let's put it this way. If you, a contractor has a certain amount of resources, they have to have a certain amount of volume to float the boat, so to speak. Um, and sure, if it came down between the two, we would much rather build a mixed-use environment because I happen to be personally into that uh, as well. 
and everything. But honestly, no, if it's also a, uh, we, we, we kind of stay away from cheesy developments. Uh, we just don't get involved with them that much. But the, the thing that we do uh, quite a bit of though are automobile dealerships that started, began out of the Hendricks Corp organization mm -hmm. and we do uh, uh, those. So if those are the bane, um, then, that's, then we're guilty uh, building those. For example, the uh, Lexus, um, the, the Lexus dealership down here, 141 and 285 uh, for Nally. Uh, but other than that, no, honestly, we, we, we promote mixed use, live, work, play as much as we can, but we are contractors and, you know, we are the building tool. Yes, sir. You mentioned Lee, uh, we're in a major water crisis now, oil is $90 a barrel. Uh, what entrepreneurial opportunities could you recommend to people graduating from college today to kind of take advantage of uh, the despair? <laughs> um, think it out. Use your head. You're, you're, you've had some training in business and economics. You've had some training in supply and demand. Do, do your own scenario. Do your own models. When you take away one resource, what's going to What's the reaction going to be in other sectors? Start thinking it out as far as what presents a need. Entrepreneurship is basically satisfying a need, and identifying the need is the greatest of all. And I do want to tell one other example of that. Um, but to get more specific to your question, we, right now, we, uh, in fact, uh, yesterday it was announced our Raleigh office hired uh, a lead, as an assistant lead professional there. Uh, we are advocating lead certification of us all. Again, I'll take my test in about two months. Um, we um, built the first lead certified facility in North Carolina. We are the, our new office in Charlotte is the first gold certified <coughs> office facility in North Carolina. So uh, Sarah Mara is with us. She is a, that's what she does for us, lead, purely lead. She's on the U.S. Green Building Council board and helped establish the criteria for lead. That's a, become a separate profit center. We are now selling lead consultation to developers and other contractors on projects. We're doing two in Florida right now. So in pure, just pure lead administration, there are some opportunities there. But beyond that, lead, you're going to see more and more and more uh, buildings that are built lead efficient um, in terms of water, water reuse, uh, condensate uh, capture, reuse, passive, solar. Um, there's a whole world of new, even evolving technology that's coming out. You know, I put in a tankless, one of those Renai water heaters. And I love the thing because it's just so, it's so efficient. You know, I go down and look at it and sh I wax it. You know, and unfortunately the plumber took his own life. Such a tankless job. So I'm not kidding. Sorry. Uh, but as far as lead, as far as lead, uh, in terms of resources and the economics of things, uh, you, you're going to see a lot more of this. And uh, uh, it's called sustainability. Uh, there's going to be more and more products reused. Uh, we did the first lead job in Georgia, and there's three separate containers of you segregate your waste, your sheetrock, your metals, et cetera, and you qualify that way. But uh, th there's a whole new uh, industry evolving just out of lead and efficient design. Now, I want to, um, first of all, can we thank Mr. Cho? Mm -hmm. thank you. Sorry for the rough day. Yeah. I want to make three quick introductions in just a couple of minutes. But first of all, our, what's the one? Okay, let me, let me introduce, we've got two of our real estate professors here. Those of you that are interested, uh, Professor Ben Kushner here and Professor Bruce Bryant. Yeah. You guys, I'm just going to thank you for to do that. I want to thank Miller for his long-term commitment to the Coles College and the university. 
Uh, John Anderson gave him the highest compliment. John is an assistant vice president here and an architect and oversees a lot of these construction projects. Also, Bob Heflin is here from the foundation. Mr. Heflin uh, manages real estate for the foundation, including these two projects for the KSU Foundation, which really finances the, uh, the new student housing and the, uh, and the debt. So good work, Bob. Uh, thank you. Clint Miller. Thank you again. Thank you very much. And thanks for being a friend of the university, yeah. too.